So today we're gonna to be going over stocks and broths. This is one of the first things you go over when attending culinary school. And in fact, in French cooking, stocks are known as fond de cuisine, meaning foundations of cooking. Of course, when you search through YouTube, you're probably gonna find a million videos labeled best ever or ultimate, or maybe even secrets of stock making. There aren't really any secrets. It's just making stocks and broths, that's all it is. The problem is with a lot of these videos is you're just given a recipe, and there aren't gonna be any recipes in this video. That's for my next few videos. The idea behind this is that you get a better understanding of the techniques and procedures for making stocks, so you actually won't even need a recipe. It'll be sort of like riding a bike. You'll make them a few times and you'll just sort of have the hang of it. So what do you say we get to it? So the first thing we need to go over is cookware. And when you go to the store, you can see here that you've got quite a few options. Okay, the first thing I wanna point out is that pots that are tall and narrow are better than ones that are wide and shallow. Taller and more narrow pots like this encourage convection. They're more likely to keep the ingredients submerged and you'll have less evaporation. So overall, they're just easier to work with. So you know what that means? This pot is for a stock making, this one's out. You also wanna look for pots that have a thick gauge on the bottom of the pot. All of the ones I have here are around a half an inch on the bottom. Pots like the one you see here are likely to develop hot spots and could give your stock a scorched flavor. And as you can see, a good stock pot really isn't all that expensive. And these two here, I've had these for almost 15 years, so a good stock pot will last pretty much forever. Well, that's it for this portion of the video. One more thing though, what's that thing that those cool YouTubers do where they go like this? I shouldn't try to do things that other cool people do. It just looks awkward when I do that. So the first thing I actually want to do is clear up a bit of terminology. In general, stocks are made from bones and broths are made from meat, uh, but they are used interchangeably. And while this doesn't really matter much to the home cook, know that you are going to get more flavor from meat and you're going to get more collagen and connective tissue from bones, which will result in a more gelatinous stock. So it's perhaps best to sort of get a combination of the two. I do hear people using the term bone broth a lot. For some reason that always sounded kind of cringy to me. I don't know why. So with that, let's go into the different types of stocks. First we have a simple stock. These stocks are made by combining the main ingredients of water and bringing them up to a simmer and simmering them for the required amount of time. Chicken stocks, fish stocks, and vegetable stocks are prepared by this method. Next up, we have white stocks. They're prepared by blanching the bones, meaning that they are brought to a boil and then strained out and rinsed, and then they are ready for the stock pot. Now, this does result in a more clear stock, but it does remove some flavor, and it's honestly not really that practical for most home preparations. I'll do it when I'm preparing stock for beef pho, which I want an extra clear stock in that case. It might also help when you're preparing stocks from game animals to reduce some of the gaminess, which can be a bit overpowering. Next up, we have brown stock. Brown stocks are made by initially roasting the ingredients until they develop a deep golden brown color. These stocks are mainly used for sauces like sauce espagnol and demi-gloss, although they're also used for soups, pan sauces, braises, and stews. Shellfish stocks are made from crustaceans, so lobster, shrimp, crab, and crayfish. They're made by combining the shells with vegetables and first sauteing them, and then combining them with water and simmering them briefly. This stock serves as the base of shellfish bisque soup, and it's also the base of a lot of classic sauces such as sauce americaine. And last but not least, we have a fish fumé. Fish fumets are made from the bones of lean whitefish. The bones are placed on a layer of vegetables, a sort of raft, if you will. The whole thing is then covered with a piece of parchment paper called a cartouche. The pot is then heated up, and once that process is done, water is added and is brought up to a simmer and cooked for the required amount of time. A little bit of wine is often added to fish fumets as well. This process does make it a bit more flavorful, but also a bit more cloudy. Now some people do categorize these things slightly differently than the way I do. I just think this makes the most sense. Well that's it for this portion of the video, so what do you say we take a trip to the grocery store and learn about some of the ingredients used for stock making? Let's go! For the home cook, chicken stock and brown beef stock are probably the most common stocks people want to make. For chicken stocks, the entire carcass can be used aside from the liver which can impart a bitter flavor. Chicken necks and backbones are especially good for stock making. When preparing chicken wings, save the wing tips for your next batch of stock. A lot of times I go the cheap, easy route and just use one of these 10 pound bags of leg quarters. Chicken feet also contain a lot of cartilage and are great for stock making. Staying with poultry, turkey tails and turkey necks are great for stock making. 
Keep that in mind come Thanksgiving. Now when it comes to beef, neck bones and knuckle bones, which are usually labeled as soup bones, are what I use most of the time. Beef shanks and marrow bones are also good choices. Unfortunately, beef parts can be a bit pricey sometimes, so if you're looking for a more budget-friendly alternative, I suggest pork neck bones. They have quite a bit of flavor and connective tissue, and they're a fraction of the price. Vegetables are generally added to stocks as well, and not just vegetable stocks. Without them, your stocks are going to be pretty underwhelming. The main combination of vegetables used in stock making is something called mirepoix, which is comprised of two parts onion, one part celery, and one part carrot. There is also a variation on this called white mirepoix, which replaces the carrots with parsnips and replaces the celery with celery root. This combination is primarily used in fish stocks and it results in a more clear, lighter colored stock. You don't have to necessarily cling to these vegetables or these particular ratios, but I like to stay somewhere in the neighborhood of this just for consistency. Other vegetables that need used up can be used in the stock pot as well. I would steer clear of starchier vegetables like potatoes, sweet potatoes, and winter squashes. Those can cloud the stock up. I would also steer clear of vegetables that bleed out like beets, which can change the color of the entire thing. Strongly flavored vegetables like asparagus, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts should also be avoided because they will turn the stock bitter and you just don't want to go down that route. Salt is not typically used in making stocks because you don't always know what the end product is going to be. For example, if you're making a sauce that requires a lot of reduction, the salt will be concentrated within that reduction. So it's best to hold off on adding the salt until you know what you're doing with it. In classic French cooking, there's what's called a sachet de pieces and a bouquet garni. To prepare a sachet de pieces or spice bag, start with a small section of cheesecloth and to that add a few sprigs of thyme, two or three parsley stems, and one bay leaf. Fold the four corners up and twist it closed the same way you would do with a loaf of bread. Tie some butcher's twine around it and then all you do is tie the other end to the pot handle. And for a bouquet garni, start with a section of a leek that's been split in half and rinsed off thoroughly. Add a small piece of celery, a few parsley stems, a few thyme sprigs, and a bay leaf. Combine the two sections and tie them together with butcher's twine. And just as with the spice bag, tie the other end to the pot handle. And as you can see, I had a little trouble tying it together. These things are so fucking pointless. Actually, fuck these things. Anyway, there you have it. Honestly, the practicality of either of these doesn't make a whole lot of sense since you're straining out the whole thing in the end. But I suppose if you want to look sophisticated, go for it. There are also a few items made from onions. One's called an onion PK and the other one's called an onion brulee. To make an onion PK, all you do is you take the onion and a bay leaf, you put the bay leaf on there, and you stab a clove through it to hold it there. Again, it's not something that makes a whole lot of practical sense. Onion brulees are often added to brown stock. To make that, all you would do is brush oil on the bottom side of this onion and char it on the grill or under the broiler. This one makes a little bit more practical sense than some of the other examples I've given. Okay, let's go over some ratios for stock making. And these are the ratios you're given in culinary school. And these prepare one gallon of stock. For meats and poultry, eight pounds plus one pound of mirepoix will produce one gallon of stock. For seafood, it's 10 to 12 pounds plus one pound of mirepoix. And for vegetables, four pounds of vegetables will produce one gallon of stock. Now these are for pretty strongly flavored stocks, so you might not want to stick with this all the way. And you also might want to consider what you're making. For example, if you're using the stock just to cook rice, it probably doesn't have to be as strong. But something like your Thanksgiving gravy or soups or sauces, you probably want a pretty strong stock for that. Okay, with that, let's take a look at some cooking times. And a lot of this is going to depend on the age of the animal, bone density, and the size of the bones that you have. But for the most part, beef and veal, you're looking about six to eight hours. Poultry, you're looking about three hours. And seafood and vegetables should take about 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, before moving on, I do want to briefly go over convenience products like bases, bouillon cubes, and those cartons of stock that you see in the store. The ingredient list shouldn't be a mile long. It shouldn't go much past meat, bones, vegetables, and aromatics. If salt is the primary ingredient, it's probably an inferior product. You can improve the flavor of these things by adding a small amount of vegetables or some trimmings while preparing them. Well, that's it for that section. What do you say we head into the kitchen now and go over the cooking process? Okay, start by covering the bones or meat with cold water with a few inches to spare. Bring the pot to a boil and you'll notice some scummy shit has risen to the surface. Skim all of that off with a slotted or mesh spoon. In French cooking, the process of skimming the surface is known as depuillage. 
Once you've skimmed everything off, simmer the stock for the required amount of time and in the last 45 minutes add your mirepoix and herbs and finish cooking it the rest of the way. Strain everything through a few layers of cheesecloth, cool the stock, and place it in Tupperware in your freezer. And with that, we've reached the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you've learned something that you didn't know before. And as always, thanks for tuning in, and see you next time.